with cooking tips, information, and 100 recipes to stay your life on. Take it easy, because it's time for my ultimate slow cooking. Slow cooking is one of the best weapons in the chef's arsenal. Not only is it easy, it's also an incredible way to transform meat into mouth-wateringly melting dishes. Mastering the art of slow cooking is something every cook should learn. First up, my phenomenal slow-cooked beef short ribs. Slow cooking is a brilliant way of getting lots of extra depth and intensity into your dishes. The secret is to lock in all those flavours at the start and let the ingredients do their thing as it cooks. These are beef short ribs, and there's basically five to six bones across there. And as the short rib cooks, it sticks to that bone. The bone implants flavour, and the meat just sort of melts. Cooked slowly, gives it that nice level of intensity. Slice alongside the bone, straight down. You can see that marbling? That sort of disappears and disintegrates. I'm cooking them in a roasting tray. Get it on the heat until nice and hot. Season the beef short ribs beautifully. Olive oil in, bone on the top. I'll we'll start colouring that in. Really important to give the beef short ribs a really nice sear. If you didn't brown the meat off, it goes in the oven and it looks like boiled meat. So you really want that nice, dark, rich colouring. Just cut the garlic in half, slide that down the side. That's going to give that beef an amazing flavour. To give body to the sauce, stir in a heaped teaspoon of tomato puree. I'm just hitting the bottom of the pan with that tomato puree. And we call it cooking out the tomato puree. Otherwise, it just goes in there raw, and it gives this sort of tartness to the braised short ribs. Red wine in. Don't use an expensive bottle of red wine. There's no need. Bring the wine up to the boil and reduce it. This burns off the alcohol and concentrates the flavour. It makes a big difference when you reduce the red wine down by half, because it gives that nice, dark, rich intensity. Look at my garlic. That is just going to sweeten everything up. Incredible. Stock in. Beef stock, perfect. Chicken stock, fine. Just to about an inch underneath the beef short ribs. Bring it up to the boil. To lock in all that flavour as the beef ribs slow cook, cover them so they braise from the bottom and steam from the top. Into the oven, two and a half hours. 170 to 180 degrees. In she goes. The great thing about slow cooking is you do most of the work in advance and then put your feet up. Five or ten minutes before the beef short ribs come out of the oven, start your garnish. This is light cured pancetta. We want nice thick lardons, nice big thick sticks of crispy bacon. These are delicious chestnut mushrooms. I'm not going to slice them, I'm just going to cut them in half. But look at the colour on those lardons now. All the white, raw fat has disappeared. The lardons have shrunk right down. And all we've got there now is the proper bacon. Mushrooms in. Beautiful. So the mushrooms get seasoned from the bacon. I'm pan frying these separately to the beef so they remain crisp and have a different texture. Mm. Leave that to cool down. Now, this is like Christmas Day for me when you unwrap that foil. Wait to see what's underneath it. <laughs> wow. They smell incredible. Lift and place on your tray. Mm. Beautiful. To make a fantastic, rich, deep sauce, press the soft roasted garlic through a sieve into the cooking juices. Want all that nice pureed garlic coming through there. Because that is going to make the most amazing flavour. <laughs> Scrape all of that off the sieve. Nice. And then just start sieving all that lovely brazen liquor. Whoa. In. That smells delicious. Take your sauce and just glaze. Do them individually. 
They deserve that respect. Spoon on your bacon and your mushrooms. Beautiful. Be generous with these mushrooms. I'm telling you, they taste amazing. Flat leaf parsley. I want that freshness over those amazing ribs. Incredible. Never ever be embarrassed about going to your butcher and asking for cheap cuts because the results are incredible. Amazing beef braised short ribs with bacon and mushrooms. Mushrooms are one of my all-time favorite ingredients. I use chestnut mushrooms with the beef short ribs because I love their firm texture and nutty taste. But there's a huge range of other mushrooms that are great for slow-cooked dishes. And when it comes to buying them, there's one expert greengrocer who's a fountain of knowledge, Borough Market's Fred Foster. Started off on uh, my dad's stall in Pimlico, really. He had a salad stall. With over 20 years of experience, he could actually write his own mushroom encyclopedia. Mushrooms, as soon as you pick them, the moisture starts coming out of them. So you need to buy them when they're fresh. Certain products you smell for flavor, and they tend to be fruits. Mushrooms don't smell nice at all. They smell kind of metallic, really. So you have to use your eyes as your guide of what you buy with mushrooms. It's really, really important. Wild mushrooms are literally grown wild in the forests. They're just quality wherever they are. This is morel mushroom. A fantastic product, so hard to find in the wild. It's almost got an apricot -y type of flavor. Earthy, woody, and of course, as you cook it, the flavor increases. For extra flavor and texture, highly prized morels are ideal when added to slow cooked stews and casseroles, as are the Trompet de la Mort, which have a deliciously rich flavor. Another wild type to try is the chanterelle. Its subtle fruity flavor is delicious and perfect fried with butter, parsley, and garlic. When you're dealing with wild mushrooms, you need to clean them. It can be quite a slow process. It's with a soft brush. Don't, don't use water. Never use water with mushrooms. It deteriorates the mushroom rapidly. Oyster mushrooms are very meaty mushrooms. Just a lovely, silky, smooth flavor. Really nice. How do you tell uh, whether it's fresh? Those gills are bright. Never cut an oyster mushroom, always tear it. Look at the whiteness of that. Beautiful. That would be gray if it was old. Although also found wild, oyster mushrooms are more commonly cultivated along with a similar type, the enoki. Their delicate taste is great in salads and soups. Finally, Fred saved the best until last. And of course, the pinnacle is the truffle. They are really, really sought after. The smell is so intense. That smell, it's, it's hard to describe because it's such a unique smell. The more expensive the truffle, the more intense the smell. So that's why you use such a small amount on a dish. It's amazing the way they get these. They used to use pigs, of course, but they don't do that anymore. They use dogs still because the pigs used to eat them all. This magical tasting fungi is by weight one of the most expensive foods in the world. It's phenomenal eaten raw, shaped over pasta or risottos, or a drizzle of truffle oil turns slow cooked stews into something out of this world. People are actually scared of mushrooms, aren't they? So it's, it's amazing, really. They shouldn't be, because take away the fear and just close your eyes and taste them. They're just amazing. They're, they are amazing. Cooking all the ingredients in one dish helps to lock in taste and get great flavors working together. Here are three recipes that turn simple ingredients into amazing dishes. First up, a fantastically aromatic melt-in-the-mouth treat, pork neck curry with mango salsa. For the curry paste, add chopped lemongrass, chili, fresh ginger, garlic, and cafe lime leaf to a pestle and mortar. Next, put in aromatic ground cinnamon and coriander, a pinch of salt, black pepper, then bash it into a rough paste. Finally, add olive oil to loosen and your paste is done. Now onto the pork neck. Add a glug of olive oil to a hot pan and brown the diced meat carefully, making sure each side hits the heat, locking in that flavor. Remove, and in the same pan, cook sliced onions until brown around the edges. Add the curry paste and fry to release all the intense flavors. Then put the pork back in, along with the coconut milk, and stir. Next, add chicken stock, palm sugar, 
more kaffir lime leaves, soy sauce, and fish sauce to taste. Then simply simmer for an hour. Slow cooked for succulents, spicy, super easy to make, and wonderful served with fresh mango salsa, pork neck curry. My next easy slow cook recipe is incredible spicy Szechuan chicken thighs. First, marinate the thighs with soy sauce and Shaoxing wine, which is made from fermented rice and tastes similar to dry sherry. Chicken thighs do a lot of work, so they need more cooking, but cooked properly, they're moist and they're the tastiest part of the bird. Next, add rice vinegar, water, then season and leave to marinate for up to two hours. Then chop garlic, chili, and ginger. Add olive oil to a hot pan and fry until softened. Add Szechuan peppercorns and orange zest. Next, add the marinated chicken thighs along with a the marinade. Then throw in a pinch of sugar and fry the chicken until it's lovely and brown and the sauce is deliciously thick. Finish with chopped spring onions, a glug of soy sauce, and a few drops of sesame seed oil. Marinated for flavor, sweet and spicy chicken, a fuss-free wonder. My final slow-cooked dish that transforms simple ingredients into unforgettable food is simple beef brisket. Start by seasoning the meat well. The brisket is a cut of beef from the breast. It's inexpensive, but it's fit for royalty with long, slow cooking. Place it into a hot casserole dish with a little olive oil and brown on all sides. Next, make a tasty broth to flavor the meat. Into the dish, add chopped carrots, celery, a whole bulb of garlic cut in half, peppercorns, aromatic cloves, and freshly ground nutmeg. Pour in hot water to braise the brisket. Bring to the boil and cover tightly. Then transfer the dish to a low oven and cook for three to four hours. Cook low and slow, the results are amazing. Tender melt-in-the-mouth meat. Fantastic with roast potatoes or in sandwiches with lots of mustard, but I like it best with tangy piccalilli in the oven in under 10 minutes. Then all you have to do is sit back and wait. So easy and absolutely delicious. What's not to love about my succulent beef brisket? This is my ultimate cookery course, 100 recipes to stake your life on. Soon, I'll be teaching you a wonderful slow-cooked dessert. And look at the color on them. The smell is incredible. But first, five more of my 100 tips to make your home cooking easier. Starting with how to cook duck breast perfectly the slow way. Duck breast, never be scared about cooking this bird. Absolutely delicious, very healthy. First, oven on, 200 degrees. And then, salt, pepper. Now, the salt will help to extract the water out of the fat. Non-stick pan, no oil, but start the duck breast in the pan cold. Skin side down, it feels and sounds a little bit weird. But as we put them into a cold pan and turn the heat up gradually, it starts to release the fat. If we put them into a hot pan, it seals them in and the fat stays in there. We want to render that fat down. 90% of that duck breast will be cooked on its skin. It keeps the duck nice and moist, but more importantly, it stays crispy. Once the fat comes out, turn the duck over. Nice, high, hot heat. Seal the duck. Now they're going in the oven, skin side down, 200, six to eight minutes. If your pan's got a plastic handle on it, then transfer the duck breast onto a tray, but make sure you put the tray into the oven to get hot first. Cooking duck is like cooking a piece of beef. Um, you can't slice it piping hot, all the goodness runs out. Just quickly turn it over, push your fingers in there, and it's slightly resistant, but still quite bouncy. And that confirms they're quite pink in the center. But the important part now 
is leaving that to rest, let them cool down, and then we'll slice them. Keep that excess duck fat, and there you go. Next time you're sauteing potatoes, you just take them to a completely different level. Now, slicing the duck, just slice it at an angle, not too thin. If you slice it thinly, it goes cold quickly, so nice thick slices. Nice crispy skin on top, and a beautiful, plump, roasted duck. All the white fat gone, nice crispy skin, and absolutely delicious. Mm. Another slow cooking tip is, when slow cooking stews and casseroles, fat will rise to the surface. To get rid of any excess oils, my tip is to remove them with kitchen paper before serving. This also works brilliantly on gravies and sauces. Many great slow-cooked dishes start by browning the meat. As the meat cooks, lots of flavors get stuck to the pan. To get it into your sauce, deglaze with wine, stock, or vinegar. Never add soft herbs at the beginning of slow cooking. They're all too delicate. The tip is to add them at the end for that hit of fresh flavor and vibrant color. A great tip when frying fish is to always fry skin side down to keep it crispy. And always lay the fillets away from you when adding to the pan to prevent hot oil from splashing towards you. Slow cooking isn't exclusive to just savory dishes. It's a clever way to transform fruit into wonderful desserts, giving them an amazing sticky, jammy intensity. Invest a bit of patience, and my next recipe pays off big time. Indulgent and bursting with flavor. Caramelized figs with ricotta. Slow cooking can also take desserts to a whole new level. A gentle, long cook can really bring out that wonderful, rich, sticky sweetness and that depth of flavor in fruits. These are black figs. They are suited to slow cooking, roasting, better than the green figs, because this outside skin is so durable. This is an amazing way of roasting figs, and it's so easy, yet so delicious. Lay your figs out in rows. Take some rosemary and just peel that down. Get that really nice fragrant stem. Get your scissors, trim the edge. Almost where you've got a bit of a sort of sharp point. Bring your three figs together and just thread the top of each fig nice and gently. Rosemary works wonderfully with sweet dishes. As the figs roast in the oven, the stalk will impart a lovely, subtle flavor. Beautiful. Dust the figs with ice and sugar, then coat them with a generous splash of balsamic vinegar. Leave them to sit there for five minutes. And they sort of marinate. I know it sounds odd to use vinegar in your dessert, but trust me, it gives the dish a fantastic sweet and sour taste. I'm going to make a really nice caramel. Four or five tablespoons of sugar. Now, flatten that out and get it nice and even. When the sugar is even, caramel cooks evenly. It's changing now. You can see it melting from the outside in. The one thing you don't do is shake the pan rapidly. You can see it almost like sort of a lake defrosting and it's hitting to the center, bubbling. It's still not dark enough yet. It's getting there. Turn the gas down and stay in control. Let the sugar melt until it turns a dark amber color. The secret behind any good caramel is just stopping it from overcooking. Lovely. Take that off the gas. Knob of butter in there. Just gently whisk in. The butter is cooling the caramel down. You'll see it changing color to like a cafe au lait. Next, add a glug of the balsamic vinegar. Nice. Beautiful. Got that nice, dark richness of the caramel. A little touch of water in there. That way the caramel doesn't go too thick. Now put the caramel back on the heat. Take your figs and sort of place them in gently. Lovely. And then just add all that lovely little marinade. Mmm, don't waste that. It's amazing stuff there. No. Icing sugar and balsamic vinegar. There's something so tasty. Based 
those figs because the skin gets nice and crispy on the outside and the fig sort of just absorbs the caramel. It's delicious. It's so easy. Now, into the oven. 190 for 10 minutes. Almost doubled in size. Now look at the colour on them. The smell is incredible onto your plate. They're a lot heavier because they've actually started absorbing that caramel. Now douse the figs with caramel and serve with ricotta cheese. The freshness of that ricotta goes brilliantly well with the figs. I'm going to finish that now with some zest and then some little nibbed almonds and the rich, creamy jam texture of the fig with the ricotta. Okay, brilliant. That is an amazing way of slow roasting fruit and taking figs to a completely new level. Follow my ultimate cookery course crammed with key lessons. Top tips and 100 recipes to stake your life on, and you'll literally be cooking yourself into a better chef. Many of these amazing recipes are on my app. Please check out the App Store for details. Go on, get cooking. Of course. Packed with cooking tips, information, and 100 recipes to stake your life on. So, sit back and enjoy my delicious, simple suppers. One of my essential mantras for becoming a better cook is it's all about building your confidence. And the way to do that is with practice. The key is to have a repertoire of easy dishes you want to cook and eat time and time again. And soon, you'll be on your way to becoming a kitchen demon. My first dish keeps it simple, but delivers big time on flavor. So it's sure to become a regular quick supper fix. Spicy tuna fish cakes. I love this recipe. Why? Because it turns this humble ingredient, a can of tuna, into something delicious. Just open up and drain the tuna into a sieve. Just slightly flake that. Don't press it too hard, otherwise you'll dry out the tuna. Now, these are water chestnuts. Just slice them nice and thin. You can buy them anywhere, any supermarket. Chestnuts in. Fresh ginger. Get rid of that rough skin on the outside. By grating the ginger, you get to get all that really nice sort of juice in. Take your spring onions and just slice on an angle. I like the texture of the water chestnut with a spring onion. A we'll touch of fresh coriander. Lovely. Next, remove the seeds from a chili to reduce its heat without losing any flavor and finely chop. Chilies in. Kaffir lime leaves. Roll them up nice and tight. Run your knife down the center once and just chop. And that makes the fish cake nice and fragrant. Touch of salt, touch of pepper. Fish sauce. Just lightly season the tuna to bind all those wonderful ingredients. Two whole eggs. And give that a nice little whisk. And then add your eggs. Get your hands in there and start mixing. Mm. Get the mixture, roll it from hand to hand with the palm, pat them down nicely. To cook, add a little groundnut oil to a hot pan. At the face of a clock, we're going to go from 12 all the way around. First one in. These fish cakes only take a few minutes to cook, so keeping track of the order they go in the pan means you know which one to turn first. Give the pan a nice, gentle little shake. Make sure that nothing's sticking to the bottom. Spatula, two fingers on top, turn them over. Beautiful. That crackling noise is something you always want because the tuna's already cooked, so we're just 
lightly frying them to get the nice crisp outside. And gently take them out. The smell, incredible. Let them sit there. We're going to make a really nice, delicious, simple dipping sauce. Start off with a little pinch of sugar. Fish sauce, two tablespoons. That gives it the saltiness. One tablespoon of rice wine vinegar and some fresh lime juice. Squeeze all that lime in there. Your fresh coriander. Lots of coriander. And in. Give that a little mix. And then you have the most amazing spicy tuna fish cakes. Who would have thought something as delicious as that can come out of a can? A simple supper in minutes that's so mouth-wateringly easy and delicious, you're guaranteed to cook it again and again. When it comes to simple cooking, there are two basic bits of kit I'm never without that will save you time and effort in the kitchen. A grater and a peeler. The swivel peeler, a stainless steel one. Absolutely incredible. It's almost like a lifesaver in the kitchen because they are so quick, so light. Swivel blade, so you've got so much more flexibility. You can actually go around the vegetable. And we call it a speed peeler in the professional kitchen because it does literally, absolutely, rapidly peels your vegetables. You have minimal waste. Good peelers cost from a couple of quid and are great for everything from peeling veg to finely slicing cheese and making shards of chocolate. A good, comfortable grip and a sharp stainless steel blade ensures you'll always work fast. The box grater is another great versatile kitchen tool. And with its planes for coarse grating, fine grating and super fine, as well as blades for slicing, it's perfect for everything from pureeing ginger and zesting lemons to shredding onions super small so they can caramelize in a flash and be sure to get a solid handle to hold it firm. And it's got such volume inside, it doesn't crush anything up. So I always prefer to grate onto a tray or into a bowl so you don't have to move it again. Grating onto the board, you've always got to lift it up and place it in. So place the grater into a bowl and grate. Two simple but essential speedy bits of kit guaranteed to make your life in the kitchen easier. Bread is a brilliant base for delicious, super fast lunches and suppers. Here are three of my deliciously simple recipes that transform a humble bit of bread into a gastronomic treat. First up, flatbreads with fennel and feta. Add olive oil to a flatbread. Then place in a hot frying pan and toast until crisp and golden on both sides. These deliciously versatile breads are made without yeast and are available in good supermarkets and local Middle Eastern shops. Next, thinly slice fresh fennel and scatter over the toasted flatbread. Then, toast aromatic fennel seeds in a hot, dry pan and sprinkle on top. Crumble over wonderfully tangy feta cheese. Finish with a drizzle of sweet and sticky pomegranate molasses. Bread transformed before your eyes. Flatbreads with fennel and feta, simple, delicious, and ready to eat in minutes. My next recipe that turns a hunk of bread into a stunning dish is bruschetta with garlic, tomatoes, capers, and pecorino. Start by slicing a baguette diagonally to get a large surface area so it holds more of the delicious topping. Drizzle the bread with extra virgin olive oil, then place it oil side down onto a scorching hot griddle. When the bread is beautifully charred, remove and rub with a peeled clove of garlic, paying attention to the edges. Next, half sweet cherry tomatoes and rub the juices into the toasted garlic bread. Then simply crush on top. Next, slice and scatter over tangy caper berries. And use a veg peeler to add shavings of salty pecorino cheese. Finally, drizzle with extra virgin olive oil and add a twist of black pepper. Fantastic fresh flavors in the flash of a griddle pan. Toast has never tasted so good. Perfect for a simple light supper or an easy lunch. My next dish is a cannellini bean crostini with anchovy and olive oil.
First, for the topping, heat olive oil in a frying pan. Add tin cannellini beans along with the juices. Once heated, gently mash the beans with a fork. Then add sliced black olives, roughly chopped parsley, and a splash of sherry vinegar. Season and leave on a gentle heat. Next, half a fresh ciabatta and splash with extra virgin olive oil. Heat a griddle pan until smoking and toast the bread oil side down, pressing it into the pan to char evenly. To serve, top the toasted ciabatta with a cannellini bean mixture and finish with chopped anchovies. Packed with bold flavours, so easy you can always make it blindfolded. Ready in under 10 minutes, but eaten in seconds. Three different breads, three fantastic recipes, proof that even when you're pressed for time, you can still eat like a king. Incredible. Welcome back to my ultimate cookery course. These are my perfect TV dinners. Next up, my guide to getting the best ingredients for your money. My shopping mantra is very simple. First, rely on your senses. Make sure whatever you're buying, it looks, smells, and really feels good. And if you get the chance to taste it before you buy it, then do it. Second, is to recognize that knowledge is absolutely crucial. The more you know about where your ingredients are from and how they're produced, the better. So, don't be scared. Ask lots of questions and learn. And when you want a simple supper, herbs are perfect to use in your cooking. They add vibrancy and an amazing depth of flavour, and once you get the hang of them, they are so quick and simple to use. And one woman who really knows these chef's best friends is expert herb grower Lorraine Melton. I love herbs. I love the way you can cook with them. I love the smell of them. She's been growing an incredible array of herbs in the wet Cambridgeshire countryside for over 20 years and can smell a bay from a basil at 50 paces. We grow about 150 varieties of herbs. It's always interesting to grow new varieties, see what they taste like, see what they smell like. It gets a bit addictive after a while. Broadly speaking, you get harder herbs and softer herbs. Softer herbs are things like parsley, basil, rocket, coriander. We grow um, two main types of parsley. We've got flat leaf parsley and curly parsley. Flavour-wise, I think they're very similar, although a lot of people would say that the flat leaf parsley has got a stronger, more aromatic flavour. This is your common basil, sweet Genovese. This is um, a purple variety called Reuben. We do Greek basil, Thai basil, holy basil. When you're looking for a basil, you want a bright, fresh basil, nice leaves, no blemishes, and nice, strong stems. It's got a lot of oils in it, and it's very strong smelling. It just tastes of summer, basil. Lorraine certainly knows her stuff, and she's right. Soft herbs are delicate, so for maximum flavor, always use them at the end of cooking, or simply add as they are to cold dishes. Here are my top five soft herbs that I could never live without. Basil, as Lorraine said, it comes in many types, all with an amazing sweet punch and flavor. Great blitzed in pestos, sprinkled whole over mozzarella, and showing its versatility, it even makes a wonderful ice cream. Parsley, beautifully earthy and intensely fresh. Use both the leaves and the stem for great depth of flavor in savory dressing, soups, and salads. Coriander. For an amazing hint of citrus, often used in Thai dishes, coriander is perfect in curries and chutneys, but it bruises easily, so treat it with care. Tarragon, a staple of French cooking. This has long, soft green leaves and a distinct antseed flavor, great with chicken or in rich, creamy sauces. Finally, chervil, both mild and sweet, a perfect pairing with fish, and incredible mix simply with melted butter for a quick sauce. Those are my favorite soft herbs. What about the hard ones? The harder ones tend to be um, a more woody plant. Things like thyme, rosemary. So you've got your common thyme, which is your ordinary, general, bog standard cooking thyme. And then you've got things like lemon thyme. We do an orange thyme, which is actually one of my favourites. It smells like thyme, but it's got a deep, sort of musky scent as well, which is just going to give you a slightly different flavour in your dish. Hard herbs, like thyme, can take more intense cooking than soft herbs, so they're great in stews, roasts, or pan frying. Choose the right one, and you can add wonderful depth of flavor to your dishes. Here are my top five I use day in and day out. Rosemary, amazingly robust with great bittersweet green leaves. It's a classic paired with lamb, delicious sprinkled over speciality breads like focaccia, or great as toppings for fruity sorbets. Lorraine's favorite, 
time. A heady aromatic pungent herb which adds delicious flavor to a Sunday roast. It's amazing with wild mushrooms and is perfect in marinades. Oregano, warm and full of delicious aromatic oils. A staple of great Italian dishes and perfect sprinkled on pizzas or in pasta sauces. Sage, a strong tasting herb with a deliciously bitter flavor, incredible in stuffings and with rich meats like pork or duck. Finally, bay, bittersweet and spicy. It's delicious simmered in soups, stocks and risottos and just as good dried or fresh. Growing herbs is a lot easier than people think it is. On window boxes, in balconies, and it's great. You can just open your window, put your hand out and snip some off. When you're out looking for herbs, make sure they look nice and healthy, no blemishes, stems look strong. They should just spring back, so nice springy sort of herbs. Smell, obviously, is quite important. Not all things smell, but obviously, if you think it's one that's going to smell like lemon thyme, it should have a nice, fresh lemon scent. And obviously, the final one is taste. You can tip a bit off and taste your herbs, and you can see what they taste like then. Whether bought from a supermarket or picked from your window box, herbs are a great way to add fresh flavours to your dishes. Perfect for delicious, simple suppers. Even if you've got a super busy lifestyle, it doesn't mean missing out on delicious desserts. They just have to be simple to make. When it comes to cooking at home, puddings should always be a pleasure and never a chore. And homemade puds are 100% guaranteed to impress. My next recipe has only two main ingredients, but simplicity doesn't mean food can't taste out of this world. Incredible griddled pineapple with spiced caramel. If you're making a dessert for one or two, it's got to be quick and easy. This sumptuous, delicious griddled pineapple fits the bill perfectly. Pineapple. Way of testing it's nice and ripe. The top of the leaves come out. Perfect, ready to go. Always cut a pineapple with a straighted edge knife. Slice off the bottom. Turn it back over and slice the top part. Now, keep that for later. Look at the core, the center of the pineapple, and slice down, directly in half. Slice that in half. Take each quarter and slice them. It smells incredible. Lay it down flat and just slice that core off. So you've got this perfect sort of boat of pineapple. Slice underneath, but stop as you get right at the end. Slicing around the skin will make the pineapple easier to eat, but leaving it attached gives you more control as it cooks. Next, heat a griddle pan as hot as you can. Start off in the corner and push it down. So you really mark the pineapple. Two minutes on each side, and then just turn them. Really nice colour there, look at that. Beautiful. I'm going to sprinkle them with a little touch of sugar. It's going to glaze them. Now, slice the top. Take out these beautiful glazed slices of pineapple. Look at that. Next up, the spiced caramel. Now, start off with your pan, nice and hot. Sprinkle four tablespoons of sugar in there. Just flatten it. Then, add the seeds from a fresh vanilla pod. In a small dusting of Chinese fine spice. Never stir caramel. Let it sort of bubble and transform. Here she goes. Now I've got the color. I want it. That's the perfect colour. Off with the gas. In with the butter. And then a couple of tablespoons of cream. Lovely. And then give that a little whisk. Add the rest of your cream. Nice. And just drip that spicy caramel over your pineapple. Mmm. Wow. Simple, elegant, and seriously impressive. Griddle pineapple with spiced caramel. A delicious treat all to yourself so that it tastes even better shared. Next, my tricks of the trade and kitchen tips. First up, the proper way to chop fresh herbs to get maximum flavor. Chopping herbs, the secret is to chop them, not bruise them. Now, basil. 
This is a soft herb, so treat it with some respect. When people go mad chopping herbs, all the goodness comes out on the board. I want the goodness left inside the basil. Place them all inside one another with the largest leaf at the bottom, and it's almost like rolling a cigar. Large one at the bottom, small ones in the center, and then look, place them down together, and just roll them. Nice and gently, don't bruise them. Step one, rolled, ready to slice. Sharp knife, imperative. Fingers tucked in. The bottom part of your knuckle is the guide between you and the herbs. That there stops you from cutting your finger. Really important to get comfortable with the knife and just practice rolling the knife across the board and relaxing that wrist. It's all in the wrist action. So, herbs up, fingernails tucked underneath and just up and down, up and down. And there you have a chopped basil that's not bruised and smelling very fragrant. Right, coriander. So you get the bunch of coriander, hold it down, and just lightly shave the leaves off the stalks. Bunch them up together, and then just, again, let the knife do the work. Tuck the fingernails in, and just chop once, and once only. Don't hack it, just chop it. You can always identify when you've bruised the herb, when you've removed the herbs off the board, and there's a big green patch. Mmm, full of flavour, and none of the goodness is left on the chopping board. A great tip for using leftover herbs, simply chop finely, mix into butter, roll up in clean film and freeze. Then when you want a herby hit, cut into slices and melt over steaks, chicken or veg. Asparagus is great for a simple supper. To prepare, always remove the lower woody stem by gently bending, and the asparagus will snap at the perfect point then boil or steam and serve with a little of my herb butter. For a cracking soft boiled egg, simply place your egg in boiling water, add a splash of vinegar and cook for exactly eight minutes. Then plunge into ice water. The vinegar helps the shell peel off easily and the ice water stops the egg from cooking, giving you the perfect runny yolk. For fuss-free salad dressings, simply add the ingredients into a jam jar. Screw the lid on tightly and shake to combine in seconds. There's no need to wash up a whisk and the jar's ready-made to store any leftovers. Follow my ultimate cookery course, bursting with valuable lessons, top tips and 100 recipes to stake your life on and you'll literally be cooking yourself into a better chef. Many of these amazing recipes are on my app. Please check out the App Store for details. Go on, get cooking.